So this morning, we're talking about the road to heaven through spirit and through faith. Uh, the verses we're looking at are Second Samuel 11, and then we will, that's kind of sort of the story that we're going to be using, and then Ephesians 3, 16 um, is the other text we'll turn to. And we're going to start by talking about desires. So before I sort of unpack this, uh, think about for yourself, and I want to get some some audience or congregation, shall we say, participation here. So think about some desire that you have. And it doesn't have to be something that's attainable. It doesn't have to be something you feel whatever. It can just be something that you would that, that you have a desire for, something that you have a want for. So any kind of want, no strings attached, shout it out. What are your desires? Well, as we have just unpacked, we all have our desires, right? Um, and sometimes we have our desires, but then we have reality, right? Sometimes they piece together and sometimes they don't. As Nelson brought up, some people say, I want a million dollars, right? But then there's reality and you look in your wallet and you say, oh, five bucks. We're doing well, right? It's a start. That's right. Five dollars at a time. We'll get there. Um, some of us have a desire to be healthy. But then you look down and then reality hits you and you realize, oh, okay. I, I try, try to look down. There's not much to look down at, but, but you can put the shoe on the other foot there. Um, see, it's one thing to change our desires. But it's yet another thing to change our abilities to live out those desires. And so this morning we're talking about desiring God. And it's one thing to desire God, to desire God's ways, to desire God's will. But to actually do something with that is quite another thing. David, as we know it has been said, is a man after God's own heart. David had intense desire for God. And desire is an incredibly important thing to have. It was commended of David that he was one who desired God to continually hone himself, to seek to be better tomorrow than he was today. But sometimes desires don't always meet reality. And sometimes David failed miserably, though his desire was there. And so we'll look at one of the most classic failings of David in 2 Samuel 11. We'll kind of skim through it a bit and not read the whole story, um, but I'm sure we're familiar with the whole thing and how it goes about. In verse 1, it says, In the spring of the year, that was the time when the kings go out to battle, David sent Joab with his officers and all of Israel with him, and they ravaged the Ammonites and the besieged Reba, but David remained at Jerusalem. And if you remember when I uh, sort of preached on this text in full, you remember I'd said this is a pat, this is a section that's sort of the setting that we sort of skip over that we don't really think anything about. about but there's two key lines in here that jump out at us. It says this is the time when d the kings are supposed to be going out to battle. They're supposed to be leading their people in these ways, but David remained at Jerusalem. So he had a way in which he was supposed to be leading God's people, and yet he didn't do that. He said, oh, someone else can handle that. I don't feel like it today. I don't feel like living up to the, the calling of being the king that I should be today. I'm a bit lazy. I'm a bit tired. I'm a bit whatever might be going through his brain or his head. And so he failed in this way at the calling of being a king. That was the first failing. And we continue on in verse 2. It says, It happened late one afternoon when David rose from his couch and was walking around uh, about on the roof of the king's house that he saw from the roof a woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful. And David sent someone to inquire about the woman, and it was reported, This is Bathsheba, daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite. So David sent messengers to get her, and she came to him, and he lay with her. And now she was purifying herself after her period, and, and then she returned to her house. 
So here we see the next failing of David. The number one, to me, is that he was taking advantage of the power he'd been given by God and using it for bad, for evil. We can look at this and say the issue that David had was that he he slept with someone who wasn't his wife or he raped them. But the issue goes deeper than that, I think. That he had something, he had this power that he should have been using for good and he used it for evil. And also he could care less about who she was. Um, says in brackets there, that she was purifying herself after her period. Now, why is this important? Why is it in there? Why is it a big deal? Well, she was ritually unclean at that time. That was part of the ways that the system worked. It was just that after certain, after a woman has had her period, there has to be a certain cleansing or whatever in order for her to then be uh, considered clean once again. And some of the, that's one of the, of course, various things that could make someone clean or unclean. And so she was in this time of doing her, her religious ritual of, of becoming clean once again. And he said, I don't care whether the, the, whether the religious laws say you're clean or unclean, whether you're a, a Hebrew or a Hittite, it's irrelevant to me. I see what I want and I've got the power to take it. And so I will. And as we know, the story continues and she gets pregnant and down in verse 15, after the whole ordeal where Uriah, her, his, her wife comes and he tries to get Uriah to go and sleep with his wife so he can pretend that it was Uriah's kid and then Uriah wouldn't do that and he gets him drunk and he still wouldn't do it and so it continues on. He sends him back to the battlefield. In verse 15, it says that the, he sent him with a letter and in the letter he wrote, set Uriah in the front, in the forefront of the hardest fighting and then draw back from him so that he may be struck down and die. David's got some, some issues going on. He's, he's a bit lazy. He's got poor leadership skills. He's taking advantage of people, abusing his power, raping people, murdering them. And this is someone who is said to have a heart for God. He intensely desired God. This is the same man who wrote to this psalm that goes, As the deer pants for the water, so my soul longs for you. And if you read the verse that continues on, it talks about how you want a drink of water when you're parched and when tears have been your food. And this is the way the psalm unpacks because for sometimes for David, this was his desire, but this was the reality. And he so desperately longed for God and yet he was going off in this direction and he couldn't seem to wrestle with it. He couldn't seem to grab a hold of it. He said, I so much desire God because I don't feel like I'm with him right now. I feel like I'm so far off that I could never return. He had some sin issues. So I think when dealing with sin, our desire to deal with it is immensely important. Change starts with a desire to change, right? If we don't want to change, it's not going to happen. If we're comfortable living in the hell that we've created for ourselves, then we'll continue to live there. Living in heaven starts with a desire to actually do that. It starts with admitting that there are areas of our lives that are a bit hellish and we want them to be more heavenly. There are areas where we could improve, where we could grow, where we could prosper, where we could flourish, areas in which we currently are under oppression. However, a desire to no longer sin is a little bit like desiring a million dollars, isn't it? It seems like a good thing. It seems like this grand goal, but maybe it's a grand goal to dream about because it feels completely unattainable at times. And we can read the pouring out of David's heart in some of these psalms that he had this intense desire and yet he, he was, was where he was. That was his reality and it felt completely unattainable to get there. But here's a question. What if, as Nelson brought up, what if you knew someone who had a million dollars and they wanted to give it to you, right? What if we know a benevolent millionaire? 
See, we can become a millionaire who was once far off from being a millionaire because there was one who was once a first, once first a millionaire. What once was completely unattainable through our own means becomes attainable. And of course, I'm putting the word millionaire in there, but if you know what, what verse I'm dancing around, it talks about how we once were far off from God, but we've been drawn near because he gave himself up for us, he being Jesus. He had something that we could never possibly have, and he gave it to us so that we can receive it. Ephesians 3 talks about this, um, starting in verse 16. It talks about this way in which we can have a reality, and then we can have a desire, and how to wrestle through that, how to work with that. And I'll give you a hint, it doesn't have anything to do with sort of trying harder on our own. Because we've been given something by God that we could not possibly attain on our own, and it is through that that we, with that and through that, that we work towards this seemingly unattainable goal. Verse 16 of chapter 3 of Ephesians says, I pray that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant that you may be strengthened in your innermost being, so that part of us that is so often so weak, strengthened with the power through his spirit, and that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, as you become, as you are being rooted and grounded in love. See, we're all weak in, in, in one way or another in our innermost being. We all know those areas of our life that we wish we were better, those things that we do that we don't want to do, those things that we say or think that we really don't want to, this struggle between desire for God and reality. It's impossible for me, no matter how much I desire to not sin, to just stop cold turkey. It's an impossibility in and of myself. But it's an intense desire. We all do things we know are wrong. We all make bad choices. We all mess up. No matter how intense that desire might be, there is still reality. We don't have the strength. But where does it say the power comes from in this verse? Verse 16. Power through his spirit. He grants us the strength in our innermost being, that place of weakness, that place that we don't want to face, that place that we want to run from. Power through his spirit. A spirit stronger than, to put David's situation up there, stronger than the spirit of laziness, stronger than the spirit of pride, stronger than the spirit of lust, stronger than the spirit of murder. See, some say, I couldn't possibly stop doing that, or I couldn't possibly start doing that. I'm just not strong enough. I could not possibly do that. And my answer to that would be, you're absolutely right. But the question is, whoever said that you were supposed to? See, desire is good, but it's not enough. Luckily, we know a benevolent millionaire who is willing to give us his own riches for our sake. We know one who has given us the power of the Spirit, a Spirit we had not of ourself. And he gave the Spirit to us so we might live out of that power, of that strength. The power to conquer sin. Power to match our desire. Verse 17, it also says where this comes from, from two places. The power comes through his spirit, but also through faith. The spirit is the foundation because it holds the power to conquer the sin, that power which we lack, but faith is incredibly important too. See, the spirit we've been given is sort of like the million dollars that the benevolent millionaire gives to us. It in itself is the thing that we desire, the means to the thing that we desire. To become a millionaire, you need a million dollars. It is the thing that makes you that. And to take out the word millionaire and million dollars, we're going to use the word grace. It's a more sort of um, Christian appropriate word in this, in this scenario. 
Um, grace is the gift that has been given to us who were hopeless of getting there without that gift. Grace opens up our eyes to see that our desires are not in vain, but in fact they are attainable. However, grace is not enough on its own. We receive salvation by grace through what? Through faith. The Spirit only works as we trust in Him. If we don't believe that God can deal with something in our life, or forgive something, or strengthen something, then it will remain untouched by his unlimited power. If the millionaire offers you a million dollars, and you don't actually have the faith that he, he has it, or you don't have the faith that he will give it to you, then you're not going to get it. That's just the way it works. Notice when Jesus heals people, what does he say to them? He says, it's your faith that made you well. Now, he wasn't unaware that he had the power of the Spirit within him. And it was that power that healed the people. He was not unaware of that fact, that the strength resided in the power of the Spirit. However, he said, your faith made you well. Because without that faith in this power, it would not have happened. So your faith has made you well. The power to conquer sin in our lives lies in both the Spirit that we have been given by God and our faith in that power. The power of the Spirit and faith are the building blocks, but the question is, what is the foundation on which these blocks stand? What is our motivator to have that faith? What spurs us on to desire to be strengthened, to no longer want to sin? Verse 17 closes with, that we read, uh, being rooted and grounded in love. That's our rooting, that's our grounding, that's our foundation. Love is the opposite of sin. Think about it for a minute. Sin <clears throat> is the act of hating ourselves or others or the world around us in some specific way that we then act out of. And so we have negative behaviors based on negative thinking, negative attitude. If you dislike yourself, you're going to be depressed. If you dislike, let's take an example, if you dislike the Muslims, you might go shoot up a mosque. You can put anything in there and say, this is a certain dislike I have for either myself or someone around me or the world around me, and I'm going to do something in response to that. So the opposite of that way of thinking and doing would be love. Love is the art of spreading heaven on earth. As we say, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Love defeats sin. Did you know that? If you think about not only how if you love someone, you're not sinning against them, but if you love someone and they were going to sin against you, they're now less likely to want to sin against you. That's a whole package we can talk about. But just the very essence of love and the very essence of sin, that Jesus on the cross was the grandest picture of love. And what was he doing there? Conquering sin. He descended into hell, defeated Satan, and rose from the dead all within the package of love. Love itself entered into the most sinful place you could imagine and won. That is the power that love has. It's a new foundation to build our lives on. So in every situation, we can ask this simple question, if you want a sort of a practical thing we can do. How would doing this or saying this or whatever it might be, how would this be loving to myself or to someone else? And it's a very uh, important question to ask. It's also a very hard question to ask when we're feeling, not feeling the love in return. When we're feeling someone oppressing us or someone sitting against us or we're in this intensely difficult situation, it's important to check ourselves and go, is it what I'm about to say loving to either me or this person? And of course, we can talk about love for a million years. We'll talk about a million dollars now. We'll talk about a million years. And what love is and what does it mean to love someone and how, how can we figure out if this is loving someone? That's an entirely different conversation. But I think it's important to ask the question, the process through it. Is what I'm about to say or about to do loving to this person or to me or to the world around me? 
And if so, then maybe I can do it. And if not, then maybe I shouldn't do it. See, the Holy Spirit and our faith in this process, over and above our own way of dealing with things, gives us the power to live in that way. Because our own way of dealing with things, we wouldn't bother asking this question. We wouldn't bother going through this process or these steps. We just say, well, this is the way things are, this is the way I feel, this is the way I think it should be done, and this is the way it is done. But if we continually bring it back and go, God, guide me, show me. I have this desire, but I want to live that out. So show me. How should I be treating this person? How should I be talking to this person in this way? How should I be working with this situation? God, guide me, because I have no idea within myself what is the best response. What is the best way to do that? And then he has the power to do it. And having the faith that he actually is going to respond, that he's actually going to give you the guidance, that he's going to direct you in a certain way that will be the best way. Clinging to this foundation is so incredibly important. And I think it's also important to note that in order to love others well, we first have to love ourselves well. We have to truly understand the power that the love has. If we think, well, I can love other people and God loves other people and I should love other people, but you know, I'm pretty messed up myself and I'm pretty, I just, I don't, I don't think God can handle what I'm going through. Well, how can we properly have faith that God will handle what someone else is going through if we don't have pro properly have faith that God will handle what we are going through? I think it's incredibly important to build that foundation in our own hearts. So when we're coming into someone else's situation, we're doing with honesty and with clarity and not sort of saying the words or pretending we have faith or thinking we might have faith, but actually having faith and knowing that God can and will do what he will in this situation. Continue on in the verse in verse 18. It says, I pray that you may have the power to comprehend with all the saints, what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth? And to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, so that you may be filled with all of the fullness of God. See, knowing the power that love holds is what fills us up with the fullness of God. Knowing, uh, comprehending is the word this verse uses in this particular translation. Knowing the breadth and the length, and the height, and the depth, knowing the whole thing, that it can fill all of these spaces in all of these ways. And even after knowing, it says, the love of Christ surpasses knowledge. So we can know the love of Christ, but it's even greater than we could possibly know. And the knowledge that it's bigger than our own knowledge is what fills us up to greater fullness than we could fill ourselves. Fill us up with God. See, if David was in this situation, his way of dealing with it would have been entirely different, wouldn't it? Imagine knowing that he had no lack within himself, knowing that he was completely filled with the fullness of God and living out of that space. Imagine when he had the option to go to war or not go to war. And he asked himself, what would be the proper thing to do based on this position of leadership that God has given to me? Obviously, I would lead my people well. And lead he would. And the rest of it wouldn't have even happened, but let's say he's still in this situation, and he's up on his roof, and he sees a woman bathing on her roof. And he asks that simple question, is what I'm thinking of doing loving to me or to this other person? And the answer to both of those is no. And we see the fruits of what happened later on, that it wasn't good for him or for Bathsheba or for Uriah or for the whole situation. And he wouldn't have sought out to kill Uriah because when he thought about it, he would have asked the question, is what I'm about to do loving to this person? No, it's not. He wouldn't have felt like he needed to fulfill something that was empty in himself. Maybe he felt like he was just a horrible leader, so he might as well stay at home and let someone else lead the battle. Maybe he felt like he was just really lonely now because his, his, his whole situation was out there, and now he's just 
at home alone. He doesn't know what to do. And he sees this beautiful woman and goes, oh, I won't be so lonely if she's in my bed. And to hide up the whole mess, he kills Uriah. There's these spaces in his heart and in his mind that he feels empty in some way, and he fills them with sin. But imagine if those spaces were filled up with the fullness of Christ. How much differently would we respond when situations come? If we have everything that we need, we won't feel the need to take it from someone or something else in order to be full. But we can't do this on our own. We can't act out of love in every situation if we are not in love in every situation. See, we can only act out of where we are. So if we are rooted and grounded in love, we can then act out of that love when we're dealing with these things. As has been said, you can't get to heaven through self-effort because it takes the power of the Spirit, the power of our faith, in order to get there. Verse 20 continues on. It says, To him who by the power of work within us is able to accomplish abundantly more than all we can think or ask or imagine. By this power that has worked within us, this power of the Spirit we've been talking about, it's able to accomplish more than we could imagine. So if you have that thing that you think of, that desire, and you think that's, that's incredibly not attainable, it's impossible to stop doing this, or it's impossible to start doing this, or it's impossible to respond in this way, I just could never possibly do it. Well, God can do even more than that in your situation, he says. He can do far more than we could even possibly imagine. If only we'd put our faith in him. We love him because he first loved us. And he gave us something that we couldn't have on our own. Gave us grace. Gave us the power of his spirit. But it all starts with that desire, doesn't it? So I don't know what situations we each deal with, what desires we have as far as the, 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 the spirit of things goes. Desire to love God more, desire to love our wife more, desire to talk to our neighbors better when they're yelling at us. Pick your situation, right? And how do we respond? In our own spirit or through the spirit of Christ? 